On one of your slides, there was a uh, mentioning of a Arctic Funders Forum. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on that initiative? Yeah, th thanks for asking the question. I just realized that I forgot to mention that. Uh, so this is something um, that was agreed in the ministerial meeting that uh, to improve coordination, it would be really critical and crucial to also talk about how to jointly fund activities. So, and what the, the ministers agreed at the ministerial meeting was to set up a, a forum of the funders, the funding agencies, uh, specifically for Arctic things. Uh, and that forum would meet probably annually uh, and then see how the countries can also join resources uh, in terms of funding Arctic research. So we have to, we have to see how that works, but the, my ministry at least is very keen and very interested in organizing and starting that. And there is, I think, a plan for the first teleconferences. We asked all the countries to, to uh, present points of contact for this funder forum, and you will hear something, I guess, uh, very shortly. Thank you. Next question. Dr. Hunting, please. Thank you. Uh, Henry Huntington from the from Ocean Conservancy in Alaska. Um, first, to me, it's very exciting to see the level of enthusiasm and, and interest from Korea and China about the Arctic. So this is, this is terrific. Um, I was thinking of what His Excellency Ban Ki-moon said at the beginning, which was that global challenges require global cooperation. Um, Pyong Chul and, and David had given some ideas about potential for for cooperation involving the, the Asian countries, but I'm curious if there are other ideas, not of, not of uh, you know, general ideas that we should all work together, but specific things that the Asian countries and others, particularly the Arctic countries, can work on together. In other words, this idea of cooperation is easy to say. Are there some specific ideas, some specific things that we could do together to put uh, Ban Ki-moon's words into action? Thank you. So, who would like to answer? Okay, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you, Henry. Well, the Arctic Fisheries Agreement is a perfect example of how countries, both within the Arctic and outside the Arctic, can work together on a common Arctic issue. Uh, high seas fisheries are not the exclusive domain of the Arctic states. There is a uh, potential for fisheries in the future to take place there involving many countries. And so we have seen how cooperation can occur under the right conditions to deal with um, uh, a matter of common interest. But the uh, presentation uh, Pyong Chul and I made was precisely to say we need more. We just signed an agreement, that's wonderful, but the real work only now starts to make the agreement um, a reality to make it well implemented. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I would, I would also add that when we were talking about these international research priorities, that then the question is how do they actually get action? And often it goes back to any country that has an Arctic research program to say how they can contribute. Uh, and that equally applies to, to countries in Asia. And so, for example, whether it's supporting observing networks in particular is being a, a big topic that's being discussed right now and how individual countries can support observing networks and building obs observations and building data sharing. I think those are, are key things that need to be supported right now. And in addition to that, I would say supporting scientists, whichever country they're coming from, supporting your scientists to be in dialogue with international science community as well, um, so that there's a dialogue among scientists that's happening no matter where they're coming from, so that all countries can really be coordinating Arctic research at the scientist level as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, a question here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, <coughs> wonderful presentation this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Fu Guo from National Chengji University in Taiwan. And I want to address uh, to the last two speakers related to the Arctic Fishery Agreement because uh, you have uh, just addressed to uh, regional issue. 
uh, you, you uh, encourage Asian countries would have to really implement or perhaps uh, come to help. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't know in, in what, whatever way a fishery agreement may not be able to uh, be materialized. So my question to both uh, presenter it would be, uh, is there any uh, action plan already in your mind? How exactly you are going to encourage all the uh, leading Asian uh, fishing uh, countries and fishing players uh, in the region to really engage? Because uh, from my understanding, most of uh, fishing uh, taking place uh, in Asian countries are pretty much uh, commercialized. So how exactly they can be uh, really helpful in a way to protect uh, the Arctic uh, resources. Thank you. Thank you. The ambassador. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I guess my answer is we have already received very strong cooperation from China, Japan, South Korea in the process of negotiating this agreement. And all three uh, signed the agreement in October along with seven others. Um, and in terms of encouraging further cooperation, well, reaching out in events such as this, the Arctic Circle Forum, to encourage further cooperation is not a bad place to start. Uh, I have suggested with Heng Chul uh, certain things that could happen next uh, to build on the cooperation we have already received, and I am hopeful that uh, that's exactly what will happen. Heng Chul. Thank you. Madam? I, no, excuse me. No, you're next. The lady, the lady here, please. Oh, no, Young Chol, if you want, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, if I may add something, at the moment there is no strong commercial incentive for uh, fishing fleets to enter Arctic waters right now, but I think this is a kind of blessing. This means some time we have to prepare for the future. And the options that David just illustrated, option one, two, three, doing nothing new and do a uh, form a committee and form a full fledged body, these are not mutually exclusive. But because we have already some nice, interesting, ongoing bits and pieces, if we form a select an option, do something in the meantime, then we will we should be able to produce something very useful and usable. That's, that's we are thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, fantastic presentations. My name is Hatla Lodotofir and I come from the Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, my question goes to you, Elizabeth, uh, regarding the uh, observer system. Very important issue and you mentioned uh, your interesting cost-benefit analysis. And I'm curious to, to see what is the status now on the next steps? Is there a momentum for, for implementation and for trying to fund this somehow together? And how do you see uh, the role of the European Commission in that regard? Okay, can you? Uh, so thank you so much uh, for the the, um, the question. I think that there is uh, quite a huge amount of uh, money that uh, the European Commission, through the Horizon 2020 new calls on the observing system, has put inside exactly in this direction. So what we uh, this, uh, through these uh, calls is also quite important for us uh, to go on for this evaluation and uh, to have a, a next step, uh, exactly as you said, uh, for this uh, work. And I think that the indeed the next calls and the last uh, tranche of calls that they are coming uh, with the Horizon 2020 addresses exactly this issue, which is uh, quite important. And I think that this uh, will be uh, the, the I think that the the um, highest investment that the European Commission is doing now, exactly as a also a follow up uh, of the work that we have done. Other panelists on this? No, thank you. Uh, sir, please. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Jim Gamble. I'm with the Institute of the North in Anchorage, Alaska. Again, thanks to all the panelists for a really uh, interesting uh, series of presentations. My question 
involves something that was mentioned a couple of times uh, during your, uh, your talks, and that is the role of the indigenous people of the Arctic and then that role that they would play in Arctic science. Um, I know that many of you have had to deal with this and, and, and know the challenges around it. And so really, it's a general question for the entire panel to say that at a high level, at the Arctic Council, at the Arctic Science Ministerial, uh, indigenous peoples are included and their organizations are included. But in reality, what's needed is indigenous peoples included on the ground where science is happening. And that's a little harder uh, mechanism to make happen. And so when we talk about a co-production of knowledge that takes place between what we sometimes refer to as Western science and indigenous knowledge, um, it really requires time and effort on the ground to make it happen. So um, I'm interested in thoughts on this. How do you see it moving forward? What mechanisms do you think might improve it? And um, just your general thoughts on uh, the benefits of this, which I think, in my experience, are, are great and, and worth the, uh, the time and effort to, uh, to accomplish. Thanks. So, Ellen? try and take a stab at this because this is something IASC has been exploring. Um, we just started an action group on indigenous involvement. Um, and, and two ideas that have, this is by no means fully official, they're still working on a final report, but a few ideas that have been coming up. One is working with funding agencies and universities to allow people the time to really build relationships so that we're working as individuals to individuals as opposed to the normal cycle of research grants where you put in a grant, you wait a year to hear whether it does or doesn't get funded. You know, you don't have the time to really work to build relationships when you have to turn around a product in two years. Um, so that's one. Another is working to find, for lack of a better word, ambassadors that can work between both communities and whether that's identifying ways to encourage um, northern residents to become scientists through the, the I guess, Western science process and provide that perspective, or um, fellowships or some other opportunity for Arctic scientists to spend more time actually living in the North as opposed to just doing research in the North. So those are just two ideas that have been floated so far. Okay, Ambassador. Uh, Jim, thanks for your question. Thanks also for your long years working on this with people like me and others. Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question, but I will offer you this. Among the many unusual aspects of the new agreement that Young Chul and I were describing today, I believe it is the first legally binding agreement in the world that expressly recognizes the interests of indigenous peoples and um, requires, obligates the parties to uh, involve indigenous peoples in its implementation. And in particular, uh, in the science work that the has to happen under the agreement, Arctic indigenous peoples uh, have the express right to participate in that. How it will unfold, that's a question we all have to deal with still, but at least it is there, as you might say, written in stone. Dr. Shin, then Dr. Rachel. I will be brief. What is e equally important is grassroots level interaction. So uh, it's a beginning stage. Maybe I can, if I can speak on behalf of Korea, we are trying to develop a program to engage especially young generation of indigenous communities who are interested in Arctic research and we are inviting people. So we will expect more uh, participation to our program. Thank you. Dr. Rachel. Yeah, as I said, for the ministerial, it was, of course, really high priority to get the indigenous participation. And we managed to do that. But the way we did it, of course, we, we invited the six pr the participants from the Arctic Council. Uh, but we offered travel support. So Germany paid for the travel of all these indigenous peoples coming to Berlin, in total more than 20 people. And that was, of course, a crucial. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to come. Um, uh, and then, of course, we thought that an important thing, and that's also what the indigenous people, I think, feel as important contribution to science is indigenous knowledge. And that's the thing that we, of course, see as important thing for observations, also involving people in observation sy systems, people living in the Arctic, involving them in local observation systems. So there are, there are lots of common interests. Uh, and I think what, what we managed to achieve, we didn't maybe achieve a lot in terms of that, but at least we built up some trust and some relationship with them, which I think is exactly also what you said. So we need to have that trust and, and friendly relationship, and that was really crucial. 
On the other hand, of course, we also had some issues that uh, we were dealing with the scientific meaning and we didn't really want to go into political discussions, but of course we, they, the, those came up as well. So, and that's also the, the challenge you also face with that uh, this is very different from, for, for the countries and for the indigenous organizations uh, in the different countries. But then of course, they also see this political perspective, which at the science ministerial meeting is not the right place actually. Thank you, Volker. One last question, Dr. Grebmeyer. Um, my name is Jackie Grebmeyer. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland Center of Environmental Science. I wanted to congratulate the, the panel uh, and the presentations that were made. Asian countries, Korea, China, and Japan have made significant input and studies in the Arctic, but it's part of a pan-Arctic system. We need to have collaboration and cross-platform science opportunities. My question to you is how do we make particularly with the Central Arctic Ocean opening up, the new fisheries agreement, how we engage incrementally scientists and decision makers in the same meeting in a forum. And so the question would be, what type of forums can you see that we can incrementally start now through the steps that uh, were, were presented during the presentation? And I'd be interested in the different aspects using organizations or other platforms. Thank, Thank you. you. Who would like to? <laughs> I think Ambassador Bolton, you've got an answer to that. Well, Jackie, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question either. Um, so I laid out, um, Chung Chul and I laid out some options for implementing the scientific aspects of the fisheries agreement. That may not be a bad place to start. <coughs> um, we uh, recommended that the uh, signatories uh, to this agreement as they become parties should establish a science committee dedicated to implementing this uh, agreement. And that should work fine for the short term. But um, my own thought, and I'm not the only one to have this, is over the longer term, at least the Central Arctic Ocean might benefit from having a dedicated marine science body that could interact with all the different science activities currently underway relating to that part of the ocean, uh, a kind of ICES or Pisces for the Central Arctic Ocean. And the thing about ICES and Pisces is it does for the North Pacific and the North Atlantic respectively some of what you are suggesting. And if such an entity could exist for the Central Arctic Ocean too, perhaps then the type of interaction between policymakers and scientists uh, might start start taking place in a regular way of the kind I think that you have in mind. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Other question, okay, Dr. Pope. I, I might also add that it, it would be great to, to establish new forums where we do get these communities really coming together, but as a start, get some, some pioneers, maybe scientists increasingly going to the policy meetings and get policymakers going to the scientific meetings. I can speak from uh, experience within the Arctic Science Summit Weeks that um, we have scientists from all sorts of different disciplines joining there. And so in order to speak across that interdisciplinary audience, you really do need to, I guess, n not just speak in the like very depths of, of disciplinary science. And so they might be more accessible um, forums than, than people might think of uh, initially. So yeah, start with what we've got before building something new as well. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, before we finish, I'm not going to ask a question, but I would like to uh, raise an important aspect, and that is the next generations of polar scientists, in particular, Arctic scientists. And as many of you will remember, um, many countries and institutions invested significantly in the International Polar Year. And we know that there have been significant legacies from a science point of view, a policy point of view, from IPY. I think one of the most important legacies of IPY was the creation of the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. And this is an association that actually is continuing uh, to this day. Uh, and I would just simply like to recognize the, the work that is being done because clearly the questions that have been raised today by everybody are not just questions for today. They're questions for tomorrow, 
and the day after and so on. And so that legacy, it seems to me, is something that we all, uh, leaders, scientists, diplomats, politicians, should actually focus on over the coming years. So with that, let me thank the panel. I think it's been extraordinary. Uh, we finished uh, 20 past, which is about on time, given that we started later. And now I do feel it's time for lunch. So please thank the panelists.